<laughs> and the whole party shook. Oh, a little quiet. Anyway, huh? it's good to be in the presence of the Lord. I'm not going to hold you much longer. We're going to get right to the Word. I don't think I have any announcements. Uh, for now, I will as we wrap up. I do want to take the time to do this, just in case the Spirit just runs out, runs over the time here. We have to continue to do the ministry. Make sure you're here at six o'clock tonight. Uh, there's there's uh, teachings in the coffee shop. Uh, I don't get a definite name to it, but I, I kind of talked about it. It's like loyalty to leadership, the covenant with your pastor, the backup. There's a blessing in the unity. And a lot of churches are broke up now because they don't have the unity and the blessing can't show up. I mean, I don't know how we think we can make a blessing show up when anybody can be Psalm says that there's a blessing in the unity. Let the oil flow down. Let it flow down. If we don't, we break it and we don't have to expect a blessing in. The Lord already told us what to do. Amen. Be there. Make time, making sure you got time to be there if you can. Uh, there in, in the coffee shop at 6 o'clock. You know. Without further ado, I'm going to bring this young man. I got one thing. You can be seated. You can be seated. Uh, for now, he might have you on your feet. <laughs> just, uh, just an old time of pondering here. You know, the Lord often pours out new wine, but he don't pour it out in old wine skins. Nope. That's tough. <laughs> That's tough because it causes me to always, as a minister, be willing to change. Yes. Right. Because if I want him to pour out of me, i got to be ready to, to adjust to the living. Amen. And sometimes it ain't look. <laughs> Man, 10 years ago, my pay was the bank. No doubt. And things just shift, but we have to learn to adapt to be able to be relevant to what's in front of us. I don't need you to look at my attire, but I'm just telling you, they got some things that come and change. The world knows how to adjust and go. The church gets stumped somewhere. Amen. I'm just saying. <laughs> brother, brother Chris, they ain't going to let you get up ever wear a pair of red pants on, I'm going to tell you right now. But this is fresh fire. We're ready for the new wine. Is anybody ready for the new wine in the place? Amen. I got half of you. I got half of you. You're going to have to get the rest of them. If you don't mind, out of this young man of God who God is bringing up and putting on platforms, listen, he wouldn't take this pulpit to Pastor Duke and say, hey, accept him in my name. He, he didn't just come in here because they all voted and Pastor Duke said, well, I don't know. No, the man of God said, hey, I'm going to let him take my pulpit. Would you have the man of God in the way of the angel of Jesus?
because I believe that it's important to know what Jesus' will is as a noun, the will, the possessive will. And it's important to know what he, what he wills to do. And you won't know what he wills to do unless you see what God sees, you hear what he hears, and you say what he says. So uh, I, I, I'm going to talk about prophecy this morning. Uh, and so when, I'll see you when she gets in here. Uh, the will of God. Praise God. Uh, as a noun, it's known as the faculty of the conscience, especially uh, the deliberate action, the power to control one's mind. Uh, what's so important is, is we saw last night, he even, he even quoted the scripture where Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. Uh, the will is just the power to do. I, I am willing myself into this thing. And so Jesus' will was subject to the will of the Father. He said, if you see me, you see the Father. Okay, so everything he did was according to the Father's will. So if you're wondering what God wants to do with your life and your church and your family, just look at Jesus. Right? If you look at the life of Jesus, that he healed every disease. Okay? And so do I pray for people that don't get ill? Sometimes that happens, but sometimes it does. And I'm not okay with the fact that it doesn't sometimes. So I'm going to keep pressing until I lay hold of everything. I'm believing God for cancer-free zones. And I'm not saying it as like a... I'm believing for cancer. No, like I will have cancer-free zones in package. We're believing God for, for healing and deliverance and, and strongholds. Uh, we have a, a state college in our city uh, that is riddled with homosexuality, uh, and it looks like bullseyes to me. I'm not scared of it. I'm in love with it uh, because once they realize who God truly says they are, he'll reveal what true love is and the lies exposed and they step in to reality of what he says. I, I don't care. Uh, uh, I don't care uh, because because he doesn't. He, he loves them. And... Uh, we love them, and, and we reach out, and we've seen lives. We've seen multiple young men. Uh, we haven't had young women yet. We've had multiple young men leave homosexual lifestyles and, and step into uh, step into the, the perfect will of God for their lives. Amen. And so, uh, it, it's important to understand. Uh, it's important to understand that Jesus had a will that he subjected to the Father. His will, he determined it himself. That I will do whatever whatever the Father wants me to do. So in Revelation 19.10, it says that the Spirit of Christ is prophecy. Uh, why? Because he declares the end from the beginning. If you're looking to see what God wants to do, you look at Christ. So prophecy is just seeing what God sees, hearing what God hears, and saying what God says. Now, a lot of people live by faith. I go to faith family church. I live by faith. I consider my man, myself a man of faith. Uh, but one of the things that, that I've really gone after here lately is prophecy. Because I want to marry prophecy and faith to where I'm not making blind statements about what I'm believing God for. But my faith grabs the prophetic gifting and I see what God wants to do. So I'm not just walking by what I don't see. See, faith, faith is a word we derive from people who don't believe. Because they, they saw us making crazy decisions like leaving our jobs to go into ministry. They saw us building churches in the middle of nowhere. And they're like, what is that? Well, uh, I guess it's faith. I guess you call it faith because you don't really know how to explain building this building here in this place, except a God that you don't see. We'll just call it faith, just so you're comfortable with what I do, right? And so when we, when we look at that, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a word we use to explain to people who don't know. But when we know him, the more we know him, we enter into a relationship with him in faith, but he reveals himself. And we begin to transition from just walking by faith but actually walking in faith to the things that he shows and reveals to us. See, prophecy is just seeing what God sees, hearing what God hears, and saying what God says. So it, it doesn't really matter if, if other people don't see it. See, I used to grow weary when I just had confessions of faith about my city until I saw my city the way that Jesus sees my city. And it was very easy for me to love my city in a city that I hated. I was living in Colorado Springs with my wife, and, my, and I live in Natchitoches, Louisiana now. Uh, I was born and raised in Natchitoches. I lived in four years in Colorado. This is where I met my wife. We got married by the grace of God, not by the devotion of our heart. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, he worked it out. Amen. And so uh, we, we moved. To, uh, we came for my dad's 50th uh, wedding and uh, my 50th, 50th birthday. And God told me, I want you to be the youth pastor here at this church. I said, okay, but you got to tell Nikki. Uh, because she said very clearly, uh, we will not move to Natchitoches. I was okay with that. We, were living in, we lived in Garden of the Gods at the foot of Pikes Peak. It was beautiful, fantastic. Uh, and God told us to move to Natchitoches. And so uh, we drove back to Natchitoches, 16 and a half hour ride. It was quiet. You know, that's a miracle. Amen. And so we, we got there and she didn't say anything for the first day. And I was cooking because I'm from Louisiana and I do it better than they do. So I'm cooking dinner. And she comes in and she's like, look, we need to have a conversation. 
And she gave me a big list of things that we need to have accomplished in order to move back. We didn't do any of those things because they weren't God's will. Uh, but it worked out. We came back and, and God, it was, it was comfortable things like you got to get this job, you got to do this thing, you got to have this house. All that went out the window the second Holy Ghost rocked her. And so uh, we've been here for six years in Natchitoches uh, working and sewing and raising savages. My little sister is in uh, Mozambique and Pimpa with Iris and uh, Heidi Baker right now. She's been there for nine weeks. She'll be back uh, next week. Uh, last week she called me and she was like, I don't have time to talk. I've only got a little bit of Wi-Fi. But she dropped some big names or whatever. They said they prophesied over us. And they said, "Where the, the place my brother's about to step into is about to be rocked with prophecy. And I wasn't planning on speaking on prophecy. So uh, it exploded in my heart. I had a dream and, and God laid out this for me to share with you today. So uh, my, she sends her beauty. She was here and she led worship with us last year. Uh, she, she is rock, man. They are... Uh, I gotta brag on them. They are pioneering a mobile iris base in Papua New Guinea when they get back. So uh, they're gonna they're gonna see the South Pacific Island saved. And I, uh, there's another thing that when, with prophecy is like when you say something that he says it explodes on the inside of you, and you're like, oh, that's that's not a cute thought. That's a God thing. Okay, cool. So um, it's it's important to understand that the will of God. And what the will of God, what Jesus' will is, uh, if you look at it as a legal term, it's what God, when someone dies, they write a will, and, and it carries things out. So when Jesus died and rose, when, when our, our, our inheritance came from a risen king, amen? And so uh, when, when the inheritance came through to us, he wrote a will and released things for us. It was his will, his desire for us to do things. He has a desire for us. And, and so uh, Paul tells us that one of the things that we're supposed to desire is prophecy. Why? Because it reveals the heart of the Father. See, so many people, especially ministries, we live with the mentality of, I have to do this, and we have to start this program, and I have to do that. But if we saw the way Jesus saw, we wouldn't do just things, right? Like a lot of people, they say, God called me to start a church. So they start building something that looks like the church that they feel like they need to build. Like, this is what I feel we need to do. But if we saw the city, the way that Jesus saw the city, if we saw the people, the way that Jesus saw the people, if we heard what he was doing in our nation. Listen, I understand for the last couple of years it's been scary for some people and now it's scary for different people and, and, and there's, there's all kinds of concern. But understand, anytime that there's a disaster, anytime there's a shift in power, we're not supposed to look to the shift in power because all power and authority comes from the Father. What we're supposed to do is look to Him and say, God, what are you doing in my family, in my city, in my church, in my, in my state, in my nation? I'm not scared of America because He's got over America. And, and he put me here to jack things up. So, it, like, the rest of America may fall into communism and antichrist, but I'm telling you, Natchitoches won't because I'm there. I won't let it happen. And you're where you're supposed to be to declare the works of the Lord and do something. We're supposed to do something. So, uh, the thing that you, uh, Jennifer, right? The thing that, I'm stepping around the pole. The thing that you felt crawling up your leg this morning, I was in here for an hour and I was praying. And I, I, I asked for open streams of prophetic and, and, and visions and callings. And so, what I saw was that there's an activation on the inside of you. That the things that you, you, the things that were like the top shelf, right? The, the oh, that's, that's hard, right? I, I was going to do it. But I was, I'm not there yet. You're there now. There's an activation yeah. on the inside that as you step out, he catches. Yeah. He leads. He guides. So don't don't draw back. But as you press it, as you lean into those unctions, you'll find that you know him more than you realize, that he's speaking to you more than you realize. So that that's the activation on the inside of you, that, that thing activating. When you're like, I've never felt this way before. And then you go out and call out diabetes. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. That's how that works. That's that's how he does things. Uh, okay. All right, there's no way. All right, praise Jesus. Uh, <laughs> all right, Revelation 19, 10, uh, the spirit of Christ is prophecy. Uh, the the Moffat translation says that prophecy is held in Christ, right? Jesus said, if you lift me up, I'll draw all men to myself. So if we have Christ in us, then we have the spirit of prophecy already inside of us. Many of us are waiting on God to do something else, but he's already done everything he's going to do. He's released everything. Roman 8 says the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives on the inside of you. If you are waiting for something that has already come, the word tells us to lift up your head, O ye gates, and let the king of glory come in. You are the gates. 
If you would lift up your head and open the gates, the king of glory would come in. He says, arise and shine for your light has already come. Past tense. You are the light of the world. I'm getting ahead of myself. That's okay though. I've got a lot to do. Uh, Acts chapter 2 says this. In the last days, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Uh, 2, 17, 18. In the last day, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even the servants and both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. Here's the thing. Um, there's there's one thing I would like to I would like to submit to the older generation. It says that they will dream dreams. Understand the dream is for the next generation. The vision is for the accomplishing of the dream. Okay, we can we can see it in Martin Luther King's "I Have a Dream" statement. A pastor who's speaking prophetically in front of a nation. I have a dream that one day. He releases the declaration, and within a few years, the manifestation happens. We have visions, we have marches, we have we have right civil rights movement that actually brings forth the manifestation of the dream. Amen. And so that's a simple way to look at it. But the Bible says that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Okay. So here's here's what's so important. As a youth pastor, uh, God sent me and my wife to Natchitoches, and He told us, "I want you to be a mother and a fatherless to a fatherless generation, motherless generation." So I was 25. Uh, we had even we had just lost our first child, or we were about to lose our first child, and we said that's not going to happen again. So now we have two girls, and I'm telling you now prophetically, so that in 18 years you'll know Emerson is for this nation, Logan is for the others. Okay. And so when when Emerson's traveling to America, and you'll be like, oh yeah, he said that at first fire that one time. And when Emerson's going all over the world, because he didn't give them to me, he gave them to me to steward to raise up to return back to him. Okay. Oh, so there it is. Uh, Yep, I'm going to leave it alone. Praise God. My wife has said three things she will never do. She said she will never live in Natchitoches. She will never drive a minivan. Uh, she will never have another kid. We drove her in a minivan and we live in Natchitoches. Praise Jesus. Um, <laughs> and if there's a third child, child, the name will be Jordan. It will flow or she will flow in the prophet. I think it will be a girl. Uh, but it will flow in the rivers as, as, as the Jordan River uh, symbolizes the Holy Spirit. Uh, there will be a ministry. There'll be a ministry to, to the church. Yep. <laughs> Prophecy is seeing what God sees, hearing what he hears, and saying what he says. 1 Corinthians 14, 1 through 6 says this. Desire the spiritual, the spiritual gifts, especially prophecy. Why? Because prophecy doesn't just blanket make blanket statements, right? See, if, if I step into your life and I make declarations of faith over you, God's going to turn it around. That's awesome. It's great. But when I can look at you and the Holy Spirit activates and he says, I see diabetes in your life and he says it's changing now. That's prophecy. It, 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 it pinpoints. It's not blanket state. Listen, I go to Faith Family Church. I am all about some faith, okay? I will faith it until I make it, all right? So, so I, I am about it. Don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is there needs to be a marriage of prophecy and faith. So that we see. So when Pastor Duke says prophesy, 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 we don't go through the rigmarole just, okay, uh, our city will be saved. No, we begin prophesying and seeing our city being saved. And it's more than just, oh, people are going to get saved. You see the strategy. See, our, our youth group has been in a six-week fast. Okay, uh, They woke up at 5 o'clock every morning and prayed in their summer break for the last six weeks. Because this is what I told them. We're going to Fresh Fire, and when we come back, we're going to have strategies. Amen. We're going to save our city. Yeah. We just are. Okay? Yeah, thanks. Cool. And so we are. We are going to change our city. We're looking for the junior high, the high school, and the college. We're going after them. We'll have them. We will have them. Okay? And so, like, that's going to be our section next year. Okay? Because we will see them saved. We're... we're, we're I'm a revivalist at heart. I can't sat, I, I can't live with this. Right? I am happy where I'm at. But our youth ministry's name is Press Youth Ministries. Because we press towards the mark to lay hold of the things that Christ has already laid hold of for us. Understand that Nacodish is in his hand waiting for somebody to plug it. When I stand before the throne, the throne of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ, I want to be able to throw my city at his feet. Okay, praise God. See, listen, some of you have, like, family viewpoint. Throw your family at his feet. Do not relent. Go after them until you can throw them at his feet. And not like, God, I give them to you. Like, look, I want them for you. Amen. Okay. <laughs> 
For everyone, uh, everyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak uh, as people, uh, but as to God. And uh, indeed, no one understands them unless uh, they utter the mysteries of the Spirit. But the one who prophesies speaks to the people they're strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Okay, so prophecy should strengthen, encourage, and comfort. Okay, I think it's very important because. Uh, Kind of when I was coming up, I was raised in the Assemblies of God for the first 16 years of my life. And we were coming on the back end where there was a lot of weird stuff in prophecy going on. There was a lot of exposing uh, and not a lot of justification, not a lot of restoration. Like a lot of things were being brought out into light. A lot of things were being really weird. And so as infancy ministry does, the second something goes wrong, we back away from it in fear. But what we have to understand is that prophecy is a gift from God. So we have to learn how to use it. And so if we mess up, we admit that we made a mistake. Come on. Come on. Because prophecy, I promise you, prophecy will usher you into humility. Come on. I promise you. Because you will definitely miss it. I promise you. But it's okay. See, so many of us have the mentality that God is the umpire behind the, behind the plate, waiting, counting our strikes, waiting to call us out. But the reality is he's our coach, and this is batting practice. The game is already won. He just wants you to swing. He's just wanting you to swing. Just swing away. And as you start swinging, he'll start critiquing. Keep your arm on the ball. You're dropping your shoulder. Keep your elbow up. Keep your hands there. Line your knuckles up. Come on, man. You can do this. And so as you step out, you go, God, I get Listen, step out and begin to do the thing that is already on the inside of you. Do it. Listen, I, I understand that she's the prophetess of this house, but understand that you all have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, and she cannot go to every place that you go and release the words that God has given you to release. Amen. Praise God. Uh, it says that I would rather have you uh, have prophecy. Luke 4, it, it, Jesus is declaring what he's here to do. He says, in, uh, he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to do these things. And he says, I'm here to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the broken heart, to deliver the captive, to, ex to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Okay? Here's what's important about this. The Spirit of Christ is prophecy. When Jesus declares a word, it's not empty. It's loaded. So on the back side of it, when Jesus read this, it says that he drops the mic, goes and sits down and says, this has been fulfilled today. And everybody freaks out. Why? Because they understood the prophecy in Isaiah. Because when that prophecy was fulfilled, what happened next was they would rebuild the ancient ruins. They would restore the places long devastated. They would renew the cities that had been devastated for generations. Strangers would shepherd their flocks. Foreigners would work in their fields and their vineyards. They will be called the priests of the Lord, uh, and they will be named the ministers of God. You will feed on the wealth of the nations and the riches you will boast. Instead of shame, you will receive double portion, and the disgrace you will rejoice will be in inheritance. Uh, I'm sorry, and instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in inheritance, and you shall inherit a double portion in your land of everlasting joy will be yours. See, when Jesus says the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to do these things, he's declaring what's about to happen. When Jesus says this, he says this in a, in a temple that is under Roman oppression. They are slaves to Rome in this moment, and Jesus says you are about to be ushered in, and then he says even now, the year of the Lord is today. This has been fulfilled today. What God wants to do is today. And so when he begins to speak and prophesy, they realize the promise. Now, here's what's so important. Prophecy does not reveal the sin. It reveals the promise. Okay? Um, I'm going to go ahead and go right into this next, next part. I want you to... Uh, I, I, I just... I'm ahead of myself. But it's okay. It's okay. Ephesians 5.18 says this. For you were once all in darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord. You are the light. So live as children of the light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with fruitless deeds or works in darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention the disobedient, okay? We are very good at exposing. We're very good. The church has got exposure down. Amen. Uh, we, we are great at it. But this is what he says. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. Here's the thing. The same way that Jesus, as the light of the world, stepped into your life and produced your darkness, uh, changed your darkness and produced light in your life, you are to be the light of the world. So if you step into somebody's life with a prophetic word or direction or, or any type of word and it does not produce light in their life, you did something wrong. Because the very first thing he says is to pursue prophecy and love. See, if, if, I, if my heart can't break for you over the word God is telling you, me to give you, I probably shouldn't give it to you. Come on, come on. Because it's probably going to be ushered in judgment instead of love. And so what, what we have to do is, one, we have to be in love. 
We have to be given to love. We have to love Him and love others. That's yeah. Jesus' yeah. commandment, yeah. right? And everything else will fall into line. In fact, most of the issues we have with ministries, they're not done in love of Him or in love of others. They're in love of self. They're in love of doctrine. They're in love of building. They're in love of me. Right? Please, God. <laughs> and everything that is illuminated becomes the light and it produces more light. So here's the thing. When, when I was outed three times about pornography in my life, it was never set for your chance. When Jesus outed me, it became light. So that every time I grab a microphone, because I know that over 80% of men struggle with pornography addiction. Uh, I worked as a counselor for a few years. That was fun uh, going through some of that. Uh, I understand that 80% of men struggle with some form of pornography or lust addiction. So that light in my life produces light in theirs. Hallelujah. And so it's hope. Because that's what he does. He doesn't just come in and go, look at the sin of the world and go back to heaven. That's not the way he works. He came not to expose it, but that the world through him would be saved. Amen. It's important. Listen, he's there to remove the thorns. He's there to remove the sting. He's there to remove the power. And Romans 8 actually says that sin is dead in you. He's there to convince you of that. So where the, it, it's not God's will for you to continue to be bond, uh, bound in those things, but prophecy releases that. It releases the promise. Because here's why. I can, I can look into you and see pornography, but that's not the promise. The prophetic identifies the pornography, and it identifies an issue of relation. It identifies an issue of love. It identifies an issue of, of close-hearted issues, right? To where you become... Detached, right? Because if you're looking at it and you saw the daughter of Christ, if the gift of prophecy was active in you while you're watching pornography, you wouldn't be able to see a woman and a man or a man and a man or a woman or whatever your thing is. That's not what you would see. What you would see is a child of God, lost and broken, hurting, right? See, if, if the spirit of prophecy was alive in us, we wouldn't be able to drive by the homeless. See, the thing is, we don't have a homeless issue, we have a father issue. Because, because you, you can't have orphans unless you have an absentee father. So if we would step up and be the mothers and fathers that God has called us to be to the lost and the hurting and the broken, we wouldn't have an issue. I, I just read a book called The Tipping Point, and one of the things it said was 80% uh, of the crime committed in a city is typically done by 20% of the people. Okay? So, so if you have 100 people, yeah. 20, 20 people. So if one of the 80 would just take one of the 20 and say, I'm going to be your pastor. You would end crime in your city. Come on. Wow. That's good. Thank you. That's good. If just one person would activate the spirit of prophecy on the inside of them and say, that is not who you are. And I'm going to bring you out. I'm going to declare what God, I'm going to see you as God sees you. I'm going to say what God says about you. And I'm going to release you into your destiny. See, like we, we can have big youth groups and they'll just go to college and do whatever. But 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 if if you if you if you we have a small youth group because there's no way I could do what I'm doing right now. I'm duplicating myself. I'm raising savages. Why? So that they can raise savages. So that they can raise savages. There is a person. I don't. Aaron's like there, but these three guys right here, Oliver, these ladies right here, these guys like quit jobs, walked away from school, and said, "We want what God has." We just, we just do. We want what he has. Walk away from relationships. Walk away from engagements. Wow. Right? Come on. Uh, come on. See, a prophet isn't unto themselves. A prophet is for the nation. A prophet serves. Okay? Because if you look at Elijah and Elisha, the only time Elijah got butt hurt is when he was all by himself. Right? I'm the only one out here. Yeah. <laughs> I want to be a bridge guy. A bridge from heaven to earth. The thing about bridges is they get walked on. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to let people walk on you. That's okay. Be because Jesus is the bridge to eternal life. His will is that everyone would walk on him. And so if we're going to be in the image of Christ, we have to be okay with people hurting us. See, here's the thing. I was hurt by, for a lot of years by ministry. Okay? Just me, right? I'm the only one. Uh, <laughs> I was hurt for a lot of years, okay? And until prophecy activated in my life, I thought he was a jerk. But when prophecy activated, I realized that hurt people hurt people. See, I didn't see him as a jerk. I saw him as, oh, you, this little boy was beat down by his spiritual father. 
and his actual father. Oh, he doesn't even know. And so when I was able to step into his life, knowing the things that he had done, he, knowing the things that he had done to me, even, even recently, I went back to him and I just loved it. And not like, hey man, I love you. Like, drove to his house, met him in his cabinet shop, hugged him, loved on him, declared prophecy over him and gave him an offer. And, and you know what he did? Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Not because he's wrong, because he doesn't know how to be loved. The, the issue is this. Listen, the world is not your enemy. Your pastor, your dad, your mom, the people who rejected you are not your enemy. They're not your problem. They're his kids. And if we could see them as his, listen, I'm not saying what they did to you is okay, but we got to be okay with it. Where it's just, whatever. Maybe you don't believe me. Uh, when Peter, when Peter, after he denied Christ, and Jesus takes him on his walk, and he acknowledges him three times, do you love me? Does I love you? Do you achieve? Does that whole thing? Then it tells him how he's going to die. You're going to be crucified, just like me. And Peter gets angry and turns around and looks at John, the only disciple who refers to himself in third person as the one whom Jesus loves. <laughs> And he goes, what about the one whom Jesus loves? And he's like, what does it matter if I let him live forever? Is it going to determine how you serve me? Oh, 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 oh sorry. I'm so sorry. No, no, I'll die for you. In fact, when Peter died, it said that he requested to be hung upside down because he wasn't worthy to share in the same sacrifice as Jesus. So, I, I, not, on, not only, see, the, he didn't want to just serve. He wanted to serve even more. Because he didn't even he didn't even want to detract. There was one man that hung on a cross. It's bad enough we got two on each side. I just want to focus on the one in the middle. And Peter said, I don't don't put me, don't muddy the waters. There's only one person you need to be worried about hanging on a cross. Put me upside down. Why? Because that's the spirit of prophecy. It's not about me, it's about what he wants. It's about what he's doing. I'm more interested in producing light in your life than you just, than being right. Yeah. Prophecy reveals the promise. In 2 Corinthians 1, 20 through 22, it says this, for, for no matter how many, uh, for no matter how many promises God made, they are all yes in Christ Jesus. And so in him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. That's in the NIV version. Here's the thing. All of us know the promises of God. We know them. Healing, deliverance, salvation in the land, all that great stuff. And his answer to all of them, God, are these your promises? Are yes. But the amen, the let it be fulfilled, is spoken and released by us. So the reason the promises are not activated in our life is because we have not released them. Because the spirit of prophecy, which is the spirit of Christ, which reveals the will of Jesus, constantly releases the yes into the earth. Constantly. So when people call you and they go, hey, I know I did this, I did that, but is there a place for me at your church? Yes! Come on! Why? Because when you get to my church, you are getting jacked up! Why? Because we're not just having service. You are getting ruined. I don't even know that's a word. You get ruined. That's how we say it in Providence Hall. That's where I'm from. Talk Mill Road. You get ruined. You're going to come out of here all kinds of jacked up in the best of ways. We want you to be so different. And you understand that prophecy cries out for that. It cries out. So many people want to be the Elijah and like, I oh, shut up the rain and now suffer. What? <laughs> Why is that? Like, you want to be God's judgment stick? And listen, here's the thing. God loves you so much and the gifts and calling to irrevocable, you can be that. You really can. You can be that. The same way you can manipulate him into blessing you by forcing his hand, and by not giving for the right reasons. The same way that you can force him to bless your ministry because you know the principles. But if you don't have the heart, you exploit it. Bill Johnson said it this way. He said, I would challenge that the cities that, that in our nation, we name like three cities. Um, and he, he actually released this right after New Orleans got there. He said, I would challenge that the reason these cities are judged so harshly, harshly by acts of nature is because the church will not forgive them. Because we're the judges of the earth. Like, it's our goal to call them into our prophetic destiny, but instead of doing that, instead of calling New Orleans saved as the Pearl of the South, 
We called it. But what if the church saw New Orleans the way that Jesus saw New Orleans? What if New Orleans saw, what if Jesus saw your bad kid? How, how does he see the bad kid? How does he see your lost child? Does he see him as lost or does he see who they're supposed to be? Well, God, I got all these promises. Yeah, and the amen is released by you as a prophet to the nations to declare the works of the Lord. But we never release it. We, we, oh, Lord God, please. Oh, Lord God. Listen, man, I am all about some prayer. We will pray all night. I'm with you. But at some point, there has to be a manifestation. And prophecy releases the manifestation of the reality and the promises of Christ. Because before the foundations of the world, the Lamb of God was already slain. Why? Because he knew the potential for mankind to be separated. And he said, you will never be separated from me. If you are, it's on you. It's not going to be on me. Before God ever said, let there be, Jesus said, I will be whatever they need me to be. Psalms 139 says that there's a story about your life that's written in heaven. It's not a tragedy. It's not. I was talking to Harold. Harold said this the other day. He was, he was giving uh, one of my guys a testimony. He's like, I didn't have no fairy tale life. I was like, what are you talking about, bro? He's like, I didn't have no fairy tale life. I was like, you were raised in the streets, addicted, blah, 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 found out you were adopted by a king, brought into a new life, and now you live for him. What are you talking about? You don't have a fairy tale life. <laughs> That's the fairy tale. You wanted to be the king that got kicked out of the palace. Nobody wants to be that guy. You got to start on the street to end in a palace. That's the fairy tale. And he goes, I never saw that. You know why? The spirit of prophecy on the inside of me doesn't see Harold as he is even now in this moment. I see him for who he's going to be. Amen. And can, can I tell you the reason most churches don't grow is because the pastors have no clue about the prophetic calling on their people. Oh, I heard a guy say this once. Uh, he was talking about Elijah and Elisha and, and how the, the people went to Elisha, Elisha before Elijah had gone on to heaven. Right? And he was like, you see, you see how Elisha didn't, didn't feed into it. And he said, you don't worry about it. You just do what you know you're supposed to do. Uh, and the only thing I can think of, but Elijah wasn't intimidated either. Why? Because Elijah realized that he was there to feed into the next generation. Amen. Listen, I love revival. Like, legitimately, I love it. I study it. You realize that every 40 to 60 years, whatever great move of God had to die off because it wasn't stewarded and passed on to the next generation. And whatever God was doing in the next generation was generally criticized by the preceding generation. So the leaders of those things usually end poorly. Why? Because they're fatherless. The, the leading example, Lonnie Frisbee of the Jesus People Movement, saw a million hippies and said, God, give them to me. They're yours. He said, you can have them. And he was in association with the church, and they were like, yeah, we can do this. And after the numbers stopped growing, and they kind of plateaued, they were like, hey, man, we're going to need you to cut your hair and take a bath and all this stuff. And, what? What? Look, look. Look at these people. I'm touching, I can't touch them looking like you. That's why they didn't come to you. They came to me. And so he got offended, which isn't okay. It's not all right. Listen, I, I understand, and this is not in my notes, so thank you, Holy Ghost. And if it's not for you, just toss it out. Listen, I, I understand that it is not okay to be offended. It is not okay to be offended with your pastors. It is not okay to be offended with your leaders. I understand that. But understand, as a leader, that Jesus speaks specifically to those who offend. And he says, if you offend and cause people to come to me, from coming to me, it's better for you to throw yourself in the ocean with a millstone around you. And I understand most pastors don't say that. But here, here's what I need my kids to understand. I am all kinds of jacked up. And so if I do something that offends you, come to me and tell me. Because I'm going to keep myself accountable to you. And if I can give it to you in the word and you're resentful in it, that's a different issue. But I can't just be right. What, I'm, what I mean is like six months ago, I didn't believe what I believe today. So what are the chances in six months I'm going to believe what I believe today? Because he constantly reveals himself and shows himself and opens the book to me. So why, why would I dig my heels in and offend people by what I believe now? Over the fact that I may not believe it tomorrow. And, okay, maybe. 
Oh man, I don't know what to tell you. Oh man. Anybody in here believe the exact same thing you believed when you got saved? Exactly. How many of you believed you were right when you got saved? It's not a problem. This is okay. Can, can, like, look at the person next to you. Look at the person next to you. They don't have it together. I promise. Do you know why? Because every one of them prays about stuff. Here, here's the thing. When Joel, as the prophet of the nation, goes before God, he goes, Oh, I thought I had it together until I saw you. Now I realize I'm undone. I'm not. Please grab something and hit me with it. Literally. The angel goes, All right, here. Bam. I'll put my words in your mouth. Oh, thanks. Glad I'm coming out of here with something besides shame and regret. This is tough. I thought I had it together, and then I realized I'm just up here making this all about me. <laughs> thanks. I appreciate it. She's a prophet. I receive it. <laughs> Praise Jesus. I want to be a comedian. I feel it did. It didn't happen. I want to be a cage fighter too, but a girl kicked me. I was like, if the girls kick this hard, there's no way. It's not happening. Thanks, Jesus. Deliverance set me free. And then I got to eat. That was fun. Praise Jesus. He's increased my pounds. All right. Uh, Luke chapter nine. Luke chapter nine says this. Uh, all right. So I want to lay lay, lay some groundwork. I'm almost done. I want to lay some groundwork. Uh, for for those of you who aren't Bible scholars, you don't know. Uh, ultimately, the, the first four books of the New Testament are called the Gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke was a traveling companion of Paul, okay? So he wasn't even there. He wasn't a disciple of Jesus. Uh, Matthew doesn't show up in his own book until chapter 9. Uh, most people believe that the, the, the Gospels were recorded about, about 40 to 50 years after Jesus had gone up to heaven, okay? Because they're like, hey, this is jacking the world up. Somebody should probably write this down, okay? So they write it down and they compile it and put it together. So uh, if I asked all of you to recount this message, all of you would say something different because it touched you or offended you in different ways. So, so you would just come together and everybody's like, all right, let's write down all the accounts and this is kind of what happened, right? And so what, what happens is we have accounts of Jesus' life and stories and through lines that carry through the Gospels. And so it, it helps us to read all the Gospels together to draw kind of a total picture of the ministry of Christ. Does that make sense? Okay, so... Um, there, there's an encounter that Jesus has with the nation of Samaria, and, he, and, he, and it's recorded in three of the Gospels. It's in four if you really kind of, kind of reach, but I, I don't want to reach, so it's in three for sure. And so here's, here's what happens. In Luke chapter 9, verse 51 through 56, he's rejected by Samaria. And here's what happens. They send forth forerunners because Jesus was the biggest thing going. And he goes into Samaria. He run, they run forth into Samaria to prepare the place. Because Jesus is coming. He's healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out devils. Like, you got to let people know that this isn't going to be just churches. Like, people don't like coming to a church service on accident. Like, if you just popped up a tent with like, hey, it's a carnival, and you came in and it was service, they would be cool with it. Much less, like, dead people were coming to life, and fingers were growing back out. They're, that's going to throw some people off. So they're letting them know, hey, look, this dude's coming. His name is Jesus. He does some wild stuff, but he's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. Samaria rejected. They said, absolutely not. Don't come. We, we have no desire for you. And here's why. Because he was going to Jerusalem. Right? So many people look at the rejection of Samaria and go, I can't believe Samaria would do that. Until you realize, through, through the story of the Good Samaritan, that the Samaritan people were a rejected people group. They were rejected by all people. So when they found out that this new Messiah was going to Jerusalem, they assumed that he was going to come there and say the same thing that they had heard prophet after prophet say about them. They assumed that he was going to come in the establishment of the church and reject them again. And so they said, look, bro, we're all good. How many times have you tried to witness to somebody about Jesus? And they're like, look, man, I've, been, I've had enough church. I've met enough people. Yeah, yeah, okay. Remember, the Spirit of Christ is prophecy. So when John, John for, uh, James and John actually decide, like, God, we're offended at this. Let's call down fire from heaven. Then they'll believe. Consume, consume them. Just wipe them off the map. And Jesus turns and rebukes him. Why? Because the Spirit of Christ is prophecy. I'll show you. In John 4, it accounts the same story, just a little different. It doesn't talk about the rejection. It talks about Jesus on his way through the city, ministering. And it says that he stops at a well to rest while the men go to get something to eat. Because the Spirit of Christ is prophecy. He sees what isn't. And a woman comes up and sits at the well, and Jesus has a conversation. He asks him for drinks. He can't give you 
whatever guru, you'd ask me for a drink, and I'd see that you're this, and I'm a this, and blah, blah, blah. And he says, if you knew the gift of God that was sitting here before you, you'd ask me for a drink because I'd give you water that you'd never thirst of again, right? And she says, oh, well, tell me about this water, right? And he says, well, go and get your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. I'm not married. And he says, you have spoken well because you've actually been married five times, and the man you're shacked up with now is not your husband, right? And she says, I perceive you're a prophet, right? And here's what's important. She goes directly into the next rejection of the church. She says, let me ask you a question, prophet. You, your people say you have to worship there, but we're not allowed in that city. So we worship here, and you say our worship is for nothing. What do you have to say about this? And Jesus, the spirit of prophecy on the inside of him, says, the time has come, and now is the time when they that worship the Father must worship him in spirit and in truth. He identifies her heart because her heart has been rejected, and she's trying to go through the motion. See, Jesus doesn't see a Samaritan woman at the well. What he sees is a woman who is trying to worship and has been relegated to worshiping in a church that isn't accepted, on a place that isn't recognized, singing songs that nobody else sings, trying to reach a God who isn't entitled to her. And Jesus says, I'm here for you. Because the spirit of prophecy, see those things are drawn to Here's what God says and says what God says. And so he reveals this thing and she's like, look, I don't know that time is coming. But it's when the Messiah comes and he says, today the man you're talking to, I am him. And she leaves her jar and she runs back into the city. This time, in the conversation, the disciples are drawing near, excuse me, and they see him coming. They see him talking to this lady. And so they run up to this lady. Uh, they run up to him and they're like, hey, Jesus, you want to... You want to eat something? And they're really judging him for talking to this lady, right? Because it's the spirit of one of the five husbands. Uh, and so they're judging him. And, and he says, do you want something to eat? And he says, I'm not hungry. I got food you don't know about. She says, what is the food? Did somebody go get him food? He goes, look, dummies. Uh, the food I eat of is of my father's will. This is what I'm about. This sustains me in ways you don't even understand. Why? Because the spirit of prophecy on the inside of me sustains me. Yeah. It, it grows and increases. And it gives me hope and visions and dreams and and so they're like, oh, okay. And, and they don't really understand. And then Jesus tells them, he releases the prophetic gift over them in this moment. He says, lift up your eyes and see. Why? Because she's running through the city. And she's telling the people, come and see the man who told me everything about me. It's important that we catch that. He said, come and see the man who told me everything about me. So the people get up and they come out to the well, the same city that are rejected. They come up and they see him and revival breaks out. And they beg him to stay with him for another three days. And he releases words and knowledge and wisdom. Because that's what a prophet does. He doesn't go, you're Samaria. They're like, we've heard this message. Right? We, we know that we're jacked up. We got it. That's why we're here. We came to see you. Do something about it. All right. Don't forget to tip your waitress to see you tomorrow. That's not what Jesus did. He releases words that changes the heart and the, the conversation that goes through the city, even to this woman, is we came to see because of you, but we believe because of the words he released in us. Here's the third, here's the third account of the story. In Matthew 10, one, uh, verse 1, it says, Jesus called his 12 disciples to them and gave them the authority to drive out impure spirits and healing and every disease and sickness. And he tells them in verse 7, he says, And you go, proclaim this message, the kingdom of heaven has come near you. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, cleanse the lepers. Freely you have received, freely give. And he tells them, don't go to Samaria. I want you to go to a place that you'll recognize what I just gave you. I don't want you to go somewhere that I've already paved the way. I want you to reach the ones that are unreached. I don't want you to carry and, and reap off of the word that I've already planted. I want you to go. And here's the thing. He promises in the, in the account in John, he actually says the time will come where the harvester will overreap. Oh, 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 I'm sorry, the, uh, the harvester will overtake the reaper, or the sower, right? The one who's reaping will overtake the sower. Here's what's so important. When Jesus sees the woman at the well, this is a woman in the Middle East in the days of Jesus. Now, so many of us, because I was raised this way, we look at the woman as a promiscuous woman. But it says she was divorced. Women don't get divorced in the Middle East in the days of Jesus five times. They get stoned for leaving their husbands. See, this woman had been rejected. She hadn't been loose. And everyone else saw her as, ugh, that woman. And Jesus saw, all oh, that woman. See, when James and John wanted to call down fire from Samaria, the spirit of prophecy saw a woman at the well. I'm not willing to burn over Samaria yet because I have someone waiting there. And so Jesus goes and prophesies and releases in her life. And he says, I, I, I'm the one you're looking for. That thing to sustain you, it's me. 
And so revival breaks out in Samaria, a place that had been shut up, and they beg him to stay for two and three days. And Jesus, Jesus tells them, look, the day is coming. We didn't even go here. Remember, they rejected you. And we're about to reap an entire city in a place we didn't sow a seed. We have been faithing for that for a long time. But what if we saw? What if we saw what God saw in our cities? What if we saw? Here's the thing. When the, when the Apostle Paul, who was formerly known as Saul, when he was just Saul, God had to prophesy over him three times to different people. And finally, he had to have a brother bring him into the city and go, no, no, you don't understand who this man is going to be. And he calls him my brother Saul. From that moment on, we see constant change to where he's referred to as the Apostle Paul. Why? Because it took someone who wasn't scared of who he used to be or what he had done, but allowed the gift of prophecy on the inside of him to see what he would become and to call him a member of the body. Yeah. And it says immediately that Paul began to preach and win people over. Immediately. That cities were saved and the presence of God rested on the city and they rejoiced and delighted because the presence of God was so heavy in their city. I firmly believe the prophecy, that, this, that the gift of prophecy has been forsaken by the church. Because of error. Like we, we mess up and people get hurt and people get offended. And so when you hear somebody go, they're a prophet, you're like, oh, okay. Okay, just make sure. Uh, no, you're right. You love it when somebody runs up to you in Walmart and is like, I got a word for you. Okay. <laughs> but, but what if we honored? What if, what if we received? And then receive the gift of the prophet. What, what if we just took all the, the mystique off of prophecy and realized that when I'm talking to Brad, all God wants me to say is what he's saying? What if, if, if Jesus was here right now talking to Brad, what would he say? That's all prophecy is. That's it. And the thing is, you hit those veins to where it's like, oh, oh where'd all that come from? Where, did, where was this? Where did this word? And you, you realize, listen, we all want to see our city saved, but, but I, believe, I believe that God wants to show you strategies. He doesn't want you just to see an unemployment rate. He wants you to see businesses. Because, because, like they work if they had a job. And the spirit of prophecy brings life to those things. So in order for your city to be changed financially, you need the spirit of prophecy. Okay. To where you're not just I don't know if you've ever had that to where you were believing for something and then God showed it to you. I was, I was 12 years old. I got filled with the Holy Spirit when I was five. I was called to preach when I was nine. Uh, and, and I had an open, my first vision, like open vision when I was 14. And, and I saw stadium Christianity. And from that moment on, there was no wavering over what I was going to do with my life. I saw, I saw the promise. And so I ran after it. Every, everywhere I went, I need to be in the youth ministry. I need to work with the youth. I need to do this. I need to do that. I need to go. I need to preach. I need to release words. I need, I need to. Every church, hey, it's different. You guys, like Stuart, do you help? Do you stir up? Do you change? Do you help develop? Why? Because the spirit of prophecy awakens you to greatness. It awakens you to the promise. It, it doesn't just point out and identify the issues in your city. It calls it into the restoration. Here's the thing. In First Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we all know it. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old thing is gone. The new has come. That verse is preceded with this statement. One time, we, we used to regard Jesus from a worldly point of view, and we totally missed it. So we don't do that anymore. So now, anyone who is in Christ is a new creature. Amen. They're changing the way they view the earth. Because it, it's costly to me not to see you the way God sees you. Amen. I, I cheat my city. I cheat my ministry. I cheat you out of not seeing what God sees in you. And it's not just enough for me to recognize, oh, God's going to do something and walk on my way. No, it is my job to call you into that. To release that, to release the promise, the fulfillment. Pastors, it is your job to create platforms for your people to minister from. And it needs to be safe. Like, we, we have prayer meetings all the time where it's like, all right, everybody's prophesying to everybody. Why? Because I want to be there when they're learning. For the same reason your dad didn't give you a bike with no training wheels ago. Figure it out. <laughs> There's a hill over there. Traffic's that way. I'd avoid that way. You didn't do that. You bring it. Oh, come on. Let me put my hand on the back. Let me help you. Let you get momentum. Let you learn. Listen, we will never be who we're supposed to be if we don't see what God sees, hear what God hears, say what He says. We will never be. 
We will never be. So right now, um, I, I want to just pray over you corporately, if that's okay. Um, if you would just close your eyes and, and, and not that it just helps me. Uh, <laughs> I just want to pray over you. Because um, when I was praying and I was fasting and, and seeking God, God, what are you going to do? I, I feel that.